Hey, GovCon Giants family, happy holidays to you. Thank you for tuning into this episode right before the holiday season is kicked off. I want to introduce you to someone really special that I had the pleasure of actually meeting in person, Mrs. Martha Daniel. I met her at the VAB conference over in Sacramento, California just a few months ago, and she had such an incredible journey uh, that she was like pretty much the godmother or grandmother of government contracting. And I'm going to tell you, she's had such a warm soul. We clicked right away, and I said, definitely, I want you on my podcast. Her company's done over $350 million in contracts. And when I asked her where she learned all that stuff from, she said, the School of Hard Knocks. So we're going to bring you someone who learned from the School of Hard Knocks so you don't have to. I hope that you enjoy this episode. And for all those folks, particularly those that are in IT technology space, this is one for the books. Again, listen to someone who's been in business 30 plus years, still making it happen, still doing it big, and still staying up with the current times, even as technology and programming systems and everything has changed, she's still in the game. So stay tuned for this upcoming episode, episode 115 with Mrs. Martha Daniel. I'm Martha Daniel. I'm the president and CEO of Information Management Resources. We go by the name IMRI. Somebody, sometimes they call us Emory. But uh, we enjoy all of the names, especially when there's revenue attached to it. So, uh, <laughs> I love it. I love so uh, it. we uh, and I'm also the chairman uh, of a of my second company, which is Cytelix, which is a cybersecurity managed service uh, SaaS company as well. And so those are the two companies that I that I represent today, and excited about their where they're going and where they've been. Uh, now I am I'm aware of IMRI, and then when I was looking, doing my homework and looking you up, I did see Cytelix on there as well. Uh, that's a new company for you. Yeah, we incubated this company uh, starting in 2016. I, we came up with the idea that we knew that uh, small businesses were going to be taxed with having to prepare themselves for cybersecurity, just as they had to prepare themselves for. ISO 9000. And so I came up with that idea, both my executive uh, VP of business development, we have two o'clock in the morning. And we said, okay, right. we need to start another company and we need to take all that we've been, we've been working in cyber for almost 11 years now. And from what we had learned, we thought, let's look at how can they do it? And can we scale what we're doing today down to a point where it's affordable for small businesses to be able to uh, deal with the requirements that we're going to for certification, which we knew were coming. Today they're here. It's like just they mandated it last year, and so it's here. So we uh, started this company. First start didn't go so well in sixteen. We brought in, hired an exec, uh, executive search firm, and found another executive. And so far, the product has been developed. We have solutions. We are operating in the. Uh, in the business world today, we uh, have th uh, two, two patents that have been given to us. Uh, we have two more pending patents and um, we support the Congressional Budget Office and 155 or more small businesses and it's increasing every day. Wow, that's, yeah. that's after you figured out how to start and set up a business and run it and scale it. So, you, yeah. so now when you first start IMRI, I'm sure it wasn't that easy for you to figure all these things out. Oh, well, no, it was not. Uh, <laughs> IMRI was an accident. I always say um, it wasn't, I, I was an executive in, in, in corporate America and a CIO of a corporation. And so of the small bank, which was the, uh, the banks that were going through the uh, junk bond oper uh, operations back in the 90s. There what kind of operations? It was called the junk bond. That was uh, bond, several okay. small business, uh, small banks that were involved with Mike Milken and a few. Oh, other I know Mike Milken. Okay, I know that. Yeah. Oh. So I was the CIO of Columbia Savings and Loan, which was the primary thought bank for the uh, junk bond um, issue that happened during that period of time. They just looked at it, found a way to, to be able to compete. I didn't ever call them gangsters. You know, people who had that back during that time, they had the ones that were stealing money. But, but uh, Columbia Savings Alone wasn't doing it. They just found a way, a loophole in the, in the regulations that allowed them to, to uh, compete in the market for interest rates. So they were using money out of their bank and 
and processing uh, loans to other companies like Eastern Airlines and et cetera. So I was the CIO and I had been brought in by an investment group to, to really separate the bank from the uh, investment. And I did that in a year. And so RTC uh, Resolution Trust took it over and FDIC took it over. And so no one knew much about Java, but we ran the operation and there was 22 other failed savings and loans in Southern California. We consolidated them. I suggested to them as the CIO that they consolidate that operations into my operations since we were the only ones that knew how to run associated with what the, the government had taken over. They did that. And then as a result of that, I looked at myself and said, oh, wow, I know something that they don't know. So let me see if I can start a business. And so I did. And I started the company up. And then while I was still the CIO and when they the bank, I would take over the um, the operations, their uh, general educations that were going on. So that, and I started I didn't know, as a result of that. So I shut down banks and, and knew how to do that. And then when Bank of America and Security Pacific merged together, they knew that I knew how to do that. So immediately I got a big contract for, for that venture that was all Northern California, uh, up through the state of Washington, all the way through Arizona. And so I started in the banking business, not anywhere in government initially. Okay. So that's how no. it was by accident. I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but here I am 30 years later. Yeah. Now, when you shut down a <laughs> bank as a CIO, I guess I, I think when I think of shutting down banks, I don't think of the CIO shutting down the bank. Oh, I had a team. Oh, no. No, I understand. Yeah, but I mean, like, I, 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 when I think CIO, I think about, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe it's, you know, I don't know what CIO, I, I think about like the actual information. What does that have to do with, I guess you're having to, to get the information and put it in a centralized database or something to that effect? Oh, absolutely. Well, what you do, you have to take all of the operations. If you think about it, a bank is running through a, a, an enormous amount of technology. That's so true. You, you're right. Okay, that so makes we sense. We got the banks, we got the ATMs, we have the the trust systems, the corporate trust, all of the various systems. So consolidating that and getting some of that down. Obviously, they had operations people on one side, but we were the technology team that would mm. go in and put it all together, moving it into our systems mm. okay, right. and consolidating it to run underneath. And that was a, a, a long process. It was, it was sure. a couple of years to get most of that done. So um, yeah, but it is an operations. And then there were operations people from the government that were running that, but I had to bring it to a point to where they could get it and see it and understand it. So mm. very intense and unique. I had a great team of uh, professionals with me too. We had about a hundred employees that, that were working at the time for me. And so uh, that was kind of the team that I took in. As long as they allowed me to keep my team, I said I would uh, be able it's to do it. Wow. Wow. And you were brought in by an investment firm. Yeah, my, my career has been that primarily the bulk of it from the early part of my career. I started as a programmer. I've done everything. I've been in IT for a long, long time since 1970 and then went into the military in cryptology. So I've been in IT a very, very long time. Uh, when women weren't even thought about, especially women of color, were not even considered. I was going to say that. I was going to say, I, I would imagine. So a lot of proving, but the military taught me I was tough. I mean, I, you know, military make you tough. I was you're very you're in the minority there as well. So when you hit go back into the uh, workforce and you find the objections of you as a female, it was easy to overcome. So I didn't have much problems in that. And plus, I knew what I knew, and I knew I was good at what I did. So I didn't have a problem at all because I could outthink them and outdo them and outwork them. So I didn't have that as an issue. That's so uh, my career moved pretty fast. And so the investment firm uh, group that I worked with was Irwin Jacobs out of Minneapolis, uh, Ted Dyko, John Malone, who ran the cable industry. They were uh, back in the early uh, 80s and 90s. There was a takeover going on in the uh, stock market. And so these were major investors that were currently, if you think John Malone was the one that started the cable shopping, with home shopping and ran all the cable through there. Mm. And so they, I, I went to CBN, uh, which was now, what's the one that's out there now? Uh, Let's see, you got, yeah, I know HSN and then you have. Um, they sold to uh, 
QVC. Yes, yeah. QVC. So, QVC. Right. so CBN sold to QVC. And so I was there during that early time of, uh, where operations and, and IT was a, a big deal. And these guys had invested in CBN to take over the industry. And they did a very good job at that. And so they had that company. They also bought Beacons Transportation, which is where I worked, bought it for its real estate. So my job was to go in as the IT person and take control. I mean, and you can see that from the, the uh, banking where I take control, take full control and roll everything up to the holding company so that they would immediately have access to the data and they shut down anybody to make decisions that can impact them. So mm -hmm. that was my job. So real, real, real tough job. I did it for about five or six uh, companies for them. And CBN, where I was in Minneapolis, was the last one. And then they sold that to QVC. And then they sent me back. They were the smallest shareholder, 10% shareholders in Columbia Savings when they sent me back to separate that from the, the, uh, the bank, from the investment. Okay, so that was my last rodeo. <laughs> but I actually, event. that's a very fascinating story for me. I, I really do enjoy that. I didn't see any of that in your bio, which I can imagine is pretty long to write that. But that's really fascinating, considering that even in the government space, we have a lot of investment companies. Uh, SBICs, we have, so we have private equity, we've got VC. So it's interesting to know because um, when I think about, I never thought about that part of it, right? Is like you said, all of our information is actually on computers, <laughs> on servers. And so we do need to get control of that when you take over a company. I never exactly. considered that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everything was automated back then and it's automated today. Mm. Yeah. All right. So now um, it says here you acquired IMRI in 1992. Uh, I acquired, uh, yeah, IMRI was an inactive company uh, when I uh, I went in with a, a partner. I started okay. this company uh, with a partner, uh, Tom Valentine, which was from a company called BCSI, which is a staffing company. Okay. And he was my 49% uh, partner. Uh, we lasted probably a year. We had different, uh, different uh, ideas of how we wanted to run the company. He wanted me to be a staffing company. I wanted to be a... A, a consulting company and consulting has far, far more risks in the IT world than staffing. Staffing, you put bodies in and you move it and you make money. I wanted to do the heavy lifting. I wanted to do the design work and all the stuff that I was accustomed to. And so we departed. I bought him out in, 19, in 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, started the business in 92. Uh, I actually went to work for IMRI in 93 because I was still at the bank when I started the company. And so um, right. once I finished that, that uh, job there, and then I went to work for the company after the contract was negotiated and in 94, I purchased it uh, from, bought it 100% back from Tom. And so I've been the 100% owner ever since. Uh, that partnership taught me a little bit less about partnerships. And I think that that's not that they're all bad, but but um, there's a lot that need to go into thinking about partnering with someone. And so um, financially, uh, it was tough because Tom had the money. I didn't have as much money mm. uh, as Tom had, but uh, I managed to land the first African-American business in, in Los Angeles. I landed the first million dollar contract with Metropolitan Water District in IT. There had been a few other smaller contracts, but back in 1994, I was awarded a million dollar contract uh, to put in an Oracle financial system as a small business where I only had about 450 to $450,000 in revenues. But uh, that was my contract. I have been in Metropolitan Water District since 1994, and I'm still there today. Wow. So that tells you uh, what a relationship can be. I still have strong relationships within that organization, even today. And I have been made, you know, done many different things. I shut right. down, brought in their data center, did a variety of work. So that was my opening and a starting point. And then obviously someone told me about being an 8A and I did that. I didn't know what that was because I was definitely not a government contractor. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I have stories to tell about that experience all by itself. Uh -huh. but, <laughs> But I had no idea what that meant, but I said, okay, well, I'll go do that. And I did, and I was uh, accepted as an 8 day contractor in 1996. And so federal government became a stepchild of mine because I had so much commercial work. Mm. So I wanted the stepchild. It's now, it's now the grown up and it owns, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the primary revenue source right. today. Right. 
But originally. But it, it, yeah, originally it was uh, the stepchild of the business that I started. Do you feel like you maximized your 8A during that time? Oh, I maximized, I maximized my 8A from okay. that time and even eight years after that. Uh, okay. um, the maximum, I, I, I received contracts. It was, it was so interesting when I, you know, people talk about the 8A program. Uh, I was very fortunate, um, you know, when I got into the program, it wasn't, hadn't been around that long. They were looking for women. So right. I, you know, right time, right place and everything. So I received a contract with uh, the Defense Information Systems Agency to, to provide resources for running the data center. And so that started the ball rolling. And so within about two or three years, I probably had about 50, 60 employees in, in Columbus, Ohio, and then Georgia, and all over the United States, not in California, right. definitely not here. So I was on a plane a lot, growing the business, understanding it, not, you know, the terminologies were different. Uh, the rules that were played were different because, you know, at IBM and at Arco and my corporate world, we played differently. Here we had a lot of rules in government, yes. so, <laughs> so <laughs> I had to learn the rules, the terminology, you know. Right. My favorite story is that the contracting officer asked me one day, well, what kind of vehicle do you have? Uh, and I said, well, what kind of car vehicle do I need? I said, because at <laughs> IBM, I just had to have a car and I had all my books in the back and I just needed a car. So and do I need what kind of vehicle do I need? A truck or what? Right. You said I need a truck, an <laughs> SUV. <laughs> I, I like that. <laughs> so she looked at me, I never forget her, and she's really a good friend of mine today. Her name was Tiny Bartosh. And she said, oh, my God, what do I have here? <laughs> I said, she said, look at this. And she said, how did you get this contract? I said, well, I bid on it. She said, oh, <laughs> my goodness. So she took me underneath her whim. And uh, that's the one thing about, uh, I can truly say, as the contracting officer, she really uh, took me in underneath her. I began to make me read the bars and learn a little bit more and and uh, we get these phone calls. You can't do that, you know. So anyway, I learned a lot, but I just shared that because that's how naive I was, right? About, wow. You know about the government terminology. <laughs> sure, and I and I know today you're on a bunch of vehicles. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah I see you're on Seaport. Yeah. You're on Stars. Yeah, yeah. I saw you're on several vehicles. So I think you figured out uh, what the vehicles that you need to have. <laughs> right. Still looking for more. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, wow, that's 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 a good story. I like that. That's pretty funny. It's like, what vehicle do you have? And and I can see that actually came to my mind because it's there's like you said, it's not common terminology, oh, right? No. And we take it for granted oftentimes when you've been doing this for a while. Yeah, that was really what I heard one of the speakers at the event that we we met at say. You really need to have a a presentation for your commercial and a presentation for your federal because the terminologies are different, and so that has been something that we practice along the way. Is that uh, making sure that our 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 presentations were. Uh, were, were done in a way that I could move them from both commercial to, to, to federal. And so mm -hmm. since we're now re-embarking re more into the commercial marketplace again, because I've, I've really saturated myself really for many years into the federal, and now the cyber has spread it and beginning to take uh, go across multiple uh, industries, I'm beginning to open back up my networks into the commercial marketplace because right. they realized I mean, that's one common denominator that all everybody is on. It says cybersecurity is a problem for everybody. That's so I, I, I realized that I needed to re, reintroduce myself back into the commercial marketplace. And, and so we are now modifying our presentation and our marketing materials. Even we're, we're revamping our website so that it can share both sides of that coin because there is differences in terminology and differences in how you present what you're saying even though it's the same solution, is whether or not you're using military terms or government terms versus commercial terms. Someone listening to this, and we glanced over it, is gonna say, okay, she started off, she had a partner who had more money, and then a few years later, they separated, she bought him out. How, how would she have the means to be able to buy her partner out at such an early stage in starting a business? 
Well, and you know what? It, I, I love that because no one knows your story. So I'm going to help with that story. Right, so that right. No, no one knows the story. And I, I love you asking that because I didn't have any money. Uh, my partner was so angry with me that he shut down the bank account. I had no money to buy him out. I needed to have about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I had about uh, had some work coming in, and I would get the money in between. And so I was very fortunate. I mentioned that I won the contract in Metropolitan Water District, right? And that was a nice, sizable contract. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> with that, and then I had a another contract at Arco. And uh, where I had worked before, where all of my friends had become managers. So obviously they knew me. And so, you know, you work your networks and that's nothing wrong with that. No. But I was able to convince the manager there that gave, that I had just won a contract. It was for training and it was for a $300,000 a year contract. I was able to convince and I'm just saying big bar cry, whatever I needed to do to right. get him to give me a $300,000 payment up front for that work. Mm. And so that 300, I mean, he, he had to go through a lot of changes, but I shared with him my story and said to him that I really, if you do this, I really would appreciate it. You know, I'm going to do the work. I was a you know manager there. So, you know, I'm going to come through. So he was able to get them to give me the $300,000 upfront payment for that year's work. And I used that money along with an invoice from I begged the accounts payable person to pay my invoice in 10 days for me and Metropolitan Water District. They right. paid that to me and the combine of that was what I put to pay him out. I waited in the lobby of, um, not the lobby, in my office in, in MWD at 5.30 that evening for the, the lawyers to send the paper across the thing that gave me 100% of my company. Wow. And I had to work my butt off after that constantly to right. make everything happen. Make so, everything right, yeah. 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 Wow. So it's not, I had no money. I had none. I had, you know, and, and that was and, I, and I'm actually happy to ask that question because that, you know, that story gives insight into the types of things that you have to do, right? When you're when you're faced with obstacles. Um, and I'm and I'm sure that having that experience sets you up for much greater success later on. Because you knew like if I can figure out how to get out of this situation. <laughs> yeah. And then you go get a line of credit. So I didn't, you know, I wasn't um, familiar with the SBA rules and guidelines. So immediately I met someone that said, well, you should go get an SBA loan. I said, well, what is that? And so I went right. to get an SBA loan. And for those who's out there that understand SBA don't get money if you don't put collateral. So I put my house up. Okay, that's all I had. And I took the collateral, took the money from them. And that's where I went for my first card. My house was my collateral. And I kept moving from one thing to the next. So right. you get to the point where your credit gets to a point where you don't have to put all of your right. assets. That's, right. Right. that's something to understand. You know, the SBA isn't in the business of giving away money without collateral. Right. And that's right. just what it is. Okay? No, I've, I've always had to put my houses up for a room. Yeah. <laughs> but that's I learned early on in my industry when I talked to some of the people who, you know, been around 20, 30 years. So when the markets were down, they doubled down on their real estate. So they could have that collateral for when the markets, you know, when they could then, when they need the money for their businesses. And so I said, okay, that's a good strategy. So I just bought real estate. That way I can have the collateral to that's put right. up for when I need it. You know, when we were short of cash or, you know, it was a longer payment term or, you know, right. the cycle. Right. We were on the other side of that cycle and it, it worked out. And like you said, yeah. they you pay the money back and then when you need it, you get the money and then, you, you know, you pay it back and you get it. And it's like having Absolutely. an extra piggy bank. That's right. Yeah, I mean, hey, that's just what, I mean, that's that came with the picture. That's how you started. Sometimes that's a risk that you have to take. And I guess if you don't believe in yourself, you know, who else is going to believe in you? So I always challenge uh, small businesses with the thought that they, you know, I don't want to get, you know, do that. Well, it's okay. I mean, that's fine. I understand that your risk, uh, you know, uh, your level of risk, <laughs> risk adversity is, is different than mine, but I, you know, I wanted the business. And so I had to do that. And, and there was some good days that, that, that happened. And there was a couple of bad times that I had to sell my, my real estate once and right. sell, sell and get, give them back their money. And, there, you know, and crank it up again. So those, those are all the stories. Yeah. Right, right. I'm with you, you know? I like that. You, like you said, if you believe in yourself, I mean, that's really it. You're yeah. betting on yourself. Right. 
Yeah, that's what you're offering. You're betting that's on yourself. You're no, that's that's great. So no, I'm glad you cleared that side up because I think again, a lot of uh oft times small business will say, Well, yeah, she's successful, she's been around, but what happened in the early days, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, people always, and again, I don't want, I, I just think that we, you know, I just want to make sure that there's any parts that I think about that I hear questions coming up. I want to stop and share. Uh, tell me, since you've been around 30 years in business, what are some of the things that are different and what are some of the things that are the same? Um, I think, let's take the uh, the difference. I think the difference is that there's been a lot more emphasis placed uh, in the in the U.S. on small businesses, and so mm. uh, that that I find uh, different, and especially uh, a lot more, uh, a far more progress pro progression has happened for uh, minority mm. uh, diversity in businesses than it was. I know people say it's not there yet, and it's not fully there, but I can tell you, it's a whole lot better than it was 30 years ago. Okay. So I, I can't say truly there's been a change. So I believe that that uh, is, is a positive. From a business perspective, I think that that has, if you're a small business with an idea and you want to go into business, there's a lot more avenues to help you be successful today than it was 30 years ago. Okay, right. so that would be my first one. The uh, what has been good, uh, you said change, and is it different and what's, what's uh, better, you know, I think. Access to 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 money is a little is better than it was. Um, access to money from the banks. I'm I'm not sure about capital raises yet because I'm in the process of doing a capital raise and I didn't really believe it would be that hard. But it has been very difficult. Even though people are out there, companies are saying, "Oh, we have money for African American businesses," and right. you know, I I'm still looking for it. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I'm still looking for it, and I wish they would come out and really be sincere about what they really are saying and versus making publicity calls because I do have some very, I have a very lucrative business and it's been very difficult for us to raise capital. So, so that's something that I think needs to change. Let's move into the next level. You know, banks, you can get the money, but moving to the next level uh, is, is a, a, a raising capital for adventure monies is a little bit more difficult for, I think, for diverse businesses. The, the positives that the globalization has been wonderful. Um, I think the ability to uh, find good qualified people uh, is, that will work for a minority company has changed. Um, those are some wonderful things out there versus being a staffing, but as a, com as a company that's providing consulting services, being able to cross in my reach for expertise to go across every uh, ethnicity has been a positive. Uh, so that's a, that's a good thing. And um, from the federal standpoint, uh, I love the fact that they are trying, the advocacy is getting better. Uh, I'm, I'm really beginning to see the real small business advocates that were there in the positions. When I first started, they were like figureheads and they really didn't do anything to help. I mean, they would kind of, they didn't have the power. Let me just go back. They okay. didn't have the power. The power that they had was to do the best that they could. And there was very limitations in what they could do. And so today, I believe that in a lot of the companies that the small business uh, advocates that are there can do and are doing a lot better and moving companies inside. And it's a little bit more sincere versus the, when I first started, it was like, you were the blocker. You were there for me to walk through the door and tell you, and you tell me to go to your database. Right, right. Okay, right. okay? Right. that's really yeah, what you do in my database. And, and they'll call you, okay? Right, right. And moving through the organization, you and I both know that you only get business by people that know you and, and understand what you do and the relationship that you build. Absolutely. And so very fortunately, because I had been an executive, I had a network. And so I was able to utilize my network to go around, okay? <laughs> and that's in the commercial. I went around a lot in the commercial. I did have a lot of commercial work. And, um, and so that was a real positive uh, for, for that. So that has changed. I really see sincerity uh, in the small business advocacies that are, uh, that are out there, that they genuinely, the majority genuinely want to move you through. And I think that if small businesses really pr present themselves in the right way, 
and be able to know what they can do, not go outside of the box and be this great big company. I know the limitations that IMRI has today. I never, I could have been much greater, but I chose to be a boutique because the quality level of my, of the services that we provide, I don't have a bad customer ever have I had a bad customer. And so I think that's important that the volume of your growth, you can make money and you can do that, but you can also go down far much quicker than any large business out there if you make some mistakes. And so that's where uh, I, I practice doing that and I control the growth of the company and that's the way we wanted it to be. And it's not that I don't, don't want to be, I'm not trying to be uh, IBM of the world. I'm not trying to be the Amazon of the world. I'm comfortable being a boutique and that was my choice. So my success driver and someone else's success driver is different. Okay. And so you define your own successes and then you manage yourself to that. Can I say something only because I don't want people to get the wrong idea. When she says boutique company, <laughs> you know, boutique is still, uh, it means controlled growth. It doesn't mean she hasn't done tens of millions of dollars because I, I, trust me, I looked her up. <laughs> yeah. You know, and so she's, she's done tens of millions of dollars. And so many, 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 many times over. Uh, so when we say boutiques, just control growth. I understand. IBM is a billion dollar firm, right? So you're comparing yourself to a multi billion dollar firm. <laughs> just, yeah. uh, just to put perspective on things, uh, only because again, everyone, you know, really truth. I want to give you your credit and your and your and your due, and then at the same time, um, because sometimes people will they'll turn off, and I don't want them to turn off. I want them to tune in and to turn up. And be taking oh. notes because I'm taking notes. I don't know if you see my little fingers typing down here, <laughs> but I'm taking notes. But I, um, I think that's great. And I really do like people being realistic, right, about what their ability to, can and can't do and what they can and can't perform. If you were to be awarded XYZ contract today, could you execute it? Could you deliver? And um, you're probably the first person I've ever heard that says I've never had a bad customer. I've never had a bad customer. Never. In the 30 years of being in business, I, when I go out and I market, I tell my, uh, when I'm doing it, I say, I can ball up the names of all the companies I've worked for, I throw them on the table, you can pick up with their number on it and call up. That's how comfortable I am with the work that we've done over the years. However, though, it doesn't limit the fact that you won't have some kind of issues on a no, problem. Right. I don't want to say that, no, but, no. but it's how you manage through it and the way that you structure your company to be able to not be surprised. And so that's one of the key factors for the success of IMRI is that we don't get surprised based on how we have structured the organization to minimize any kind of surprises. And we, we are working right now in 19 states and internationally, and I don't get surprised. Okay, so that's the key. I won't be surprised on anything that goes on because typically is how you manage that. And that was an IBM training. <laughs> so, so, I mean, oh, really? It was an IBM training. I still execute on the IBM training. One of the greatest training, one of the greatest marketing companies I've ever worked for and one of the greatest uh, companies I've ever worked for. Back in the early uh, 80s when I joined them, it was just the most unique experience and I carry it today and I teach it today and I embed many of the processes today into my business today. Is that training available to people offline or no? Uh, for, I, for my training? For the IBM type of training that you were trained, is that something no, that we can? No, that was internal. That was, oh. I was working as a consultant. So the work okay. that I do today is the work that I did for IBM, right. the global service. I was one of the first employees hired when IBM talked about their consultant services practice, I'm going to uh -huh. age myself, but they didn't have a practice. It was uh, it was an independent business union, unit, and they hired a bunch of people out of uh, Orange, uh, out of uh, LA, and uh, we were the very first. I was the very first global service employee, one of the very first ones for IBM. They didn't have a name for it at the time, and so we were the consultant. And so uh, that's how I started uh, very in my consulting business. So most of what I learned during the consulting was how they operated. And so I took that training. They trained us extensively right. in the ability to support uh, their uh, sales engineers and um, their salespeople. So we were really kind of software engineers uh, that supported all of the sales for, um, for IBM. And that's how they started it initially. Yeah. Okay. All right. No training for Eric. 
<laughs> so they took off of that training. But I <laughs> I, look, I want to take the training. <laughs> take the training. Uh, they, 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 they train internally, but they were right. good. Okay. All right. That's fair. Uh, tell us. I'll give you one-on-one one day. Okay. Thank you. All right. I, all right. I'll come to California to get my training, my one-on-one training. Okay. I, I will come to California and what do they say? I'll put in my sweat equity. I'll give you some coffee and I'll go run to the store yeah. for you. Whatever. Okay. To all get right. my You're training. Good. All right. <laughs> all right. I'm good. This fine. So tell us a couple of things that successful or future successful entrepreneurs have to worry about personally and professionally, emotionally. Um, some things just put on people's minds as they are uh, setting the expectation for some of the things they may experience. I know you shared a little bit about the differences back in, like, you know, where there's more opportunity today, but what are some of the other things that maybe um, are, they don't necessarily come off in a general presentation or a workshop? Yeah, I, I think that the first uh, factor, and I think I alluded to it a few minutes ago, is define your success define it, uh, you know, and kind of understand. And then because that is going to be the driver of the amount of commitment that you're going to make. Um, you know, some people drive to be, you know, a, a different level. And so define your success. It's okay if you want to be, you know, a one person or two person, if that's your choice, then understand what that means. And so I think that's a very important factor because that is going to be the one that's going to keep you up at night because once you decide that I want to be successful, I look back over uh, the first interview that I had uh, out here and I said that I wanted to retire at 52 and I was going to be a hundred million dollar company. <laughs> I just started the company. You know, I probably have been in business maybe four or five years. Uh -huh. and, 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 I, and I drove at that pace and that was an unrealistic goal that I set for myself initially. And I found that the the level to dr the the drive real realistically uh, means that you have to do certain things to build a company. And so I I always say that that's the first factor. I began to tone that down, get it into into perspective to what I what we what what the company wanted to be. We've done over three hundred fifty million dollars in in contracts. We 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 have managed large contracts, so uh, very nation. Um, right. Uh, level contracts that we've been involved in, but the key is defining that level of success. And then the second part I would say is that don't be greedy. That's the other part. You don't have to take from anybody. There's enough work out there for anyone. I, I got this thing I call guts is what I call it. Okay. And that's the guts. So the acronym is what I live by is greed. You don't have to be greedy. You don't have to take from each other. You don't have to fight with anyone. You really can share. And if you find that you can't share on this one, then depart and go find another one. Later on, you'll come back around. This is a small world out here. And people that you step over going up, you definitely will come back down because small businesses are roller coasters. They go up and down. And that's just the way the business cycle is for any business. Right. But for smaller businesses, it's a roller coaster. Right. So don't, don't be greedy. The second one is, um, is uni, uh, unilateral. You, you can't do it by yourself. Unity is all part of it. So uh, the work with people, uh, put your contracts in place, be honest, be straightforward. I, the first thing that I deal with in a contract is I deal with the money. What can we fight about most is about money. Okay, so let's get the money understanding of what we're going to do when it's good and what we're going to do when it's bad. So when we put our team in agreements together, we're clear about it. Now, who's going to do what? Because if you clear that up early in the game, everything else is okay. You'll work through all the other issues. It's right. usually the money that drives it. So right. unity is being able to go out and unite yourself and meet with other people and partner. That's a good part. And then the T is for trustworthiness, okay? You have to be honest and trust. Say what you mean, do what you say. You know, just don't, you know, be a good person and realize that, that if you do good, good comes to good. And that's the other. And the last one is my spiritual side of me, which is the S which is I believe in divine governing in my life, uh, that I believe that there are some things that I get into that I have to really pray about. So I am one of those people who believe that, that prayer changes things and open up doors because I've seen it. I've been at the bottom or the rock bottom. I've never hit the bottom, but I've been there and come back right back up. So that part of me and that divine part is what gives me my solace and my peace in the midst of the storm of being an entrepreneur. Because I have 100 people I have to make payroll for. And I know their families. Some of them I know, some I don't know as personal. But 
that that's a burden when things aren't right, that if something happened there that I'm impacted some of the people lives. And so that's important to me. Wow. Very well said. <laughs> Very well said. No, I, I like that. Um, and, and I love the fact that you said in your team agreements, you get the money part out the way up front, um, how when things go good and when things go bad. Yeah. Because you're right. At the end of the day, everything else could be worked out. The money is, is always the issue. Always the one that causes yeah. the worst, worst, worst nightmare. Yeah. 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 What is one thing that was hard when you started that's still hard today? I think the, 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 the hard part today still is hard is uh, breaking and, and keeping the revenue at the pace and growing organically simultaneously, you know? Right. So if you think about, I've been in technology for now 30 years, it is a very dynamic, it didn't stay oh, static, right. okay? Right. I started with mainframes, okay, all right? And we're now in an evolution of globalization that is unbelievable with AI and ML and everything else. Right. So the question, what for me it has been, how did how could I stay in this business? Right, how do you stay relevant? Years? Right. Right. While right. it's continuously changing, and I'm a service company, and I'm providing consultant services, having to be an expert in the knowledge of whatever is in the industry at that time. Okay. So that has been <laughs> that that was always the challenge. And the challenge to that was being able that I experienced was being able to move away, move away from being a staffing company. Because what happens, you win a contract, you bring in some people, and then they go away. That's how it was in the commercial market for me. Mm -hmm. So when I moved into the federal market, it gave me longer term contracts that allowed me to build a company and build expertise inside. Right. And so began to put staff members that had jobs that knew they weren't going to end in three months or four months, right? Or five months on a contract right. that's short term. And so that allowed me to build the company. So that expertise, right? Of being able to build dynamic. And then the second part is being in tune. I always stayed ahead of the game. I kept reading and knowing. So if I, I mean, I've been at Y2K, I wrote books if, you know, on Y2K. So I became a Y2K expert. Cyber, we managed to get into cyber back in 2009, 2010, I think it was. We got into the cybersecurity space, okay? Uh, moving from the mainframe to the mid-tier, uh, Arco gave me a contract. I installed different systems. I became an expert in client server. So it was moving with the time. So it's following the money. So that, that has been my biggest, biggest thing for the business that I'm in. It's been very dynamic and challenging. I can't say. And then jumping in and then getting cranked up and then getting contracts and something that's new that you haven't done before, right? Right, right, so that's right, been, right. But that's the fun part of it. That's, that's what I was going to say. You sound like it's the fun. <laughs> I see your face and you don't <laughs> seem like you're too stressed out about this at all. <laughs> that's the fun part. Yeah. Yeah. So that's been the fun part of it. But that has been the challenge. Of, right. And so I've seen several companies or friends of mine that started companies that are gone. You know, they are not in business because they didn't move with the time and weren't able to uh, do that dynamic change as quickly. And again, I think that's also from some of the training and from my background being in IT, um, this is where I started. This is the business that I've been in. This is what I sold and this is what I've been in. So that, that creativity that I'm now having to do a succession, right? If right. the business is going to go, uh, as long as I've been in it, I have to begin to succession this business, right? And so that's something that I'm bringing in now in the company to transition some of that knowledge base that I have or even hire even those that are better, you know, and get them on board so that it allows me a chance to enjoy the remaining portions of my life and still do fun things like what I'm doing today. Wow. Wow. That's great. That actually brings me to a question because you brought up the books and the reading. How much do you think formal education versus self-education helped you? Uh, I would say um, the formal education was really a good foundation as well as the experience mm -hmm. and, um, and the opportunities that I had working in the commercial prior to go starting my own business. 
I don't know. And I've seen people do it without it. I, you know, I can't say, but I know that for me, uh, the ability to have worked in the commercial, to work, to have worked and achieved all the way up to CIO. And I did that in probably like 10 years, 15, 12 or 13 years from the time that I started in IT. I think it was 12, 13 years. So um, getting to that point and having that experience and that training really benefited IMRI. I, uh, you know, I understood how to put marketing materials together because I wanted to look like a Rolls Royce instead of Volkswagen, you know, so that was the IBM in me, right? right. I need to look at it. I, I sold for them. They looked that way. So I went out the same way and I wanted to look the same way that they looked. And so things like that were definitely, you know, experience and then the experience. So education, knowing IT is important, was important for me because right. I don't I could have done this business and stayed in it as long if I myself was not uh, technically savvy. I, I do. I hear of, um, of people that says, yes, I run a technical company, but I'm personally not, a you know, I'm not the, a technical person. So I, I've, I've heard that before from, from people. And, and then that, I believe that that could happen if you bring in, if, if you have the financial whereabouts to have had a good technical staff with you. I, I do have a very, very strong executive vice president that runs, that, that has many years in from the government perspective that's been with me for 19 years. I've relied on her to uh, help build the, um, the, the business as well. But along the way, the decisions that were being made, you know, you still, so that's where that person is talking about. I have the, financial background or I have the operations background right. to operate something, but you certainly can't walk in and, and certainly I don't, even today, I don't walk in and do my total technical sales, but I am capable of being able to look at where we're going after a multi-million dollar contract to be able to determine uh, the kinds of things that need to go into that to be successful. And I think that the reliance my, my risk is, is, is lessened by the fact right. that I have but that have expertise. That, right. that person who doesn't have that technical expertise could get burned, okay? And if you, and I'm just sorry, they can't, okay? All right, because they just can't, okay? No, no, no. You're right, no, you can get, I mean, no. people, I think sometimes we, we only think about the money side, but I mean, there's a lot that goes with that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, there's a, I mean, there's a, there's a risk, there's a, there's a huge, risk and i know for, for example in us in the construction world having if you don't have experience in construction and you just bid a project based on what your contractors give you you can definitely be upside down really really fast because uh, oftentimes they will overlook some things or they'll be only be focused on their specific item and then we have scope creep or a gap in scopes and i'm sure you probably have something very similar in the tech in your in your world as well what this is gaps in a scope oh yeah Right, Absolutely. they're they're Absolutely. assuming that this is going to be done, but it wasn't written completely in the scope of work. Right, right, and then the scope changes on you. So how do you determine the cost or the impact of that scope change, and and being able to manage through that? And so you may have your tech team that's there, but the risk is on the it's on the uh, company. Right. So so the risk mitigation side of that of being able to be involved in that level of conversation and understand the technical implications you know, of of what could and could not happen. I mean we. That's one of the facets that I think is uh, important, but but it's successfully done. People can do it, and I'm not knocking it. I just know that the risk, you know, that you take with it is. Oh, it, when you're you starting know. out small businesses, you want to minimize your risk to the greatest right. extent possible. Right, and and it can't just be your passion either. I mean, I see a lot of small businesses. Oh, I want to do this because I love it so much. Talk and, about that. Yeah, and then you don't realize, you know, I, 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 to be honest with you, I had to work with my husband on that. He had a passion for, uh, you know, a business that he really wanted to do, and he started it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I wanted to allow him to have that flexibility, but he had to learn, you know, I understand that passion, but you're not making any money. Okay, so let's look at how do you make money with this passion? Right. Well, and, 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 the, and, and he couldn't get there. Okay, it couldn't get to the level where it could be a passion. I said, so enjoy it as a passion, 
but it doesn't necessarily have to be the business. Okay. Right. So, and I've had that uh, conversation with a lot of small businesses. It said, I, I love to make cakes. The lady said, oh, I love to make them. Okay. Well, are you going to open up a cake store? Or are you going to, I want to open up a cake store. Okay. Well, let's understand that. That means, are you going to be the only baker? You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And, right. and you know, you know, by, so thinking about how do I turn the passion into, it's okay, but understand what it takes to turn the passion into where it makes money because passion, you can't stay in a business with just your passion. Okay. You can't. You no, can't you got to make money. You got to make money. You got to have revenue. <laughs> right, you gotta make money. Okay. I mean, All right. That's, that's really the key. <laughs> and that's really what I'm saying. It's right. fine to have passion, but you got to make money to stay in business. And right. this is why so many small businesses go out of business in the first two years because it's passion. And mm-hmm. you got to be able to turn passion to revenue. And how do I get to a point where it's self-sufficient and it can generate? Even your time is worth money, mm-hmm. okay? Because if you're on a job, you got paid. So when you did say, oh, I could be the only person working my company, but you don't have any money left, well, you can't pay your bills and you can't pay yourself. That's that's passion. That's not a business. Right. I pay myself to work every day. I really do. And I have always paid myself. From the day I walked into my company, I pay myself because I feel myself is worth to be paid. Okay. Right. Now I've had the whole checks. Don't get me wrong, man. <laughs> I've a small business. I've had to hold them up a few days. Not the whole <laughs> but I paid it. But I paid it. But I- <laughs> okay, that's it. Okay, this one can't be cash today. Okay, and going to drop off day or two or something. But I, one day is going to get paid, you know? It's got paid. He said, I got to hold that check. I paid myself, I but I had to hold it. that check. Yeah, I got to hold it. <laughs> You're too funny. Okay, so right. I'm just painting the picture of being an entrepreneur. You can hold your check to pay the rest of the people sometimes, but, right, but, but you, I, I pay myself. You did pay and yourself. when money comes back right, I pay. Yeah. So and you cash and check. Cash. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like, you can you cash a check. Uh, that's great. Um, <laughs> I like that one. That was a good one. Going back to uh, the self education question, any books that you would recommend small businesses for them? Um, things that you've read, things that you enjoy, things you've shared, things that you've talked about. and I've had a few books, I mean, you know, um, that I've read, but most of my, I'm going to be honest with you, most of my learning came from the hard knocks. I chalk up, I had, I, early in the years, I didn't have a chance to do a lot of, uh, I would go to conferences and that, but I didn't have a lot of time. So it was the hard knocks, you know, I learned from, from what I what I did and what I, I challenged myself after every time something didn't go right or wrong, I look at it. I, I step back away from it and look at it and learn. But you know, obviously, you know, the typical ones to build your company, you know, your your management, your all of your your uh, books that are out there that you right. read, you know. I get them every day. I I skip. But to be honest with you, in in the years that I've been in business, most of it has been going to conferences. Mm-hmm. learning from that introduced by 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 uh different most of my learning was through conferences and then through my my own mistakes i call it the hard knocks i didn't have money to go uh, or i didn't have time to go to to a lot of the uh, time to read all the books but when i hit this mistake or i made this error or i you know hired this wrong person you know, because the biggest thing, okay, now let's look back and evaluate what we did. What did I do right? What did I do wrong? How could I make it better? What processes should I put in place? What should I have learned from that, that experience? And some of my experiences cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars, okay? Not thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I tell people that for all the bad hires I've made, because I like people, I could have a whole block in Beverly Hills, okay, for all the bad <laughs> hires that I've had. So that's one of the biggest factors, too, is learning. You have to learn from what you do. And proposals that we lose, we go through, we evaluate, we go back and say, what could we have done differently? And how do we miss this by 200,000? Or how do we miss this by 50, uh, $25, $25 million? I, I, we just did a bid just recently, and we were, thir- uh, we were 21 million, and the other company came in at 13 million. Mm. That's a big gap. Right, right. Okay, so pull my team together. What, 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 what did we do here? What did we not see? Now we realize that they can't do it for that. So we're going to go back in another four or five months and tell them, say, okay, how they doing? Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> how they doing? Because we know you can't do it for right. that. Right. You just low bid and got in there, but we know you can't do that. We went back and it's impossible. Mm. 
it was an impossible task, but they awarded the contract. So, so we made a strategy to go back in four months and talk to the contracting office because we know you can't do it. Right. Okay. So now we may have been too high at 21 million, but still yet, <laughs> you can't do it for 13. Okay. Mm. All right. right. And bring in people. I mean, now you bring some animals or something, but you can't do it. In that, in that form. Okay. You can't do it with people. Yeah. What does work life balance look like for you? Uh, it's a lot better today because all of my kids are grown. And okay. uh, so it's just me and my husband and balances. Uh, balance to me, though, uh, I've always been able to enjoy life while, while working hard. And I'm a firm believer in that. So uh, I enjoy conferences and I went to those, but I also take vacations. Uh, I believe in vacations. I do that. I take time off. I set aside time. I mean, I work hard. I work through the week and I give my sometimes 60 hours or more a week. And I mean, I'm more 70, you know, whatever I need to do. And I work in, in spurts, you know, you have proposals that go through and we are there and that. But I'm a believer that you have to allow yourself time to let your brain operate and think through. So I do take vacations. I've been, been to 58 countries and, and, and I just take vacations. I love to travel. And uh, while I'm traveling, I try not to do any work. If it, I was gone for 20 some days one time and I, I had to pick up the computer a couple of times and that's okay, you know, it's all right. I'm on a different time zone. So that's what my balance was. When I hit my children, for those who may be listening that had kids, I had to put them on the calendar. I mean, it's just that simple. You put them in the calendar, you calendar your events, just like you calendar uh, everything else. And I learned that the hard way because I had to, uh, I missed several games or missed something that was important. And the tears of that uh, taught me, if it's important to you, you put it on the calendar. Look at all these other people you have on your calendar. And that kid, was important to be at that game, you calendar that. And so that's what I learned to give balance, to give myself the sanity of peace, to not feel guilty about uh, the fact that I worked and I couldn't provide. And I would tell my son, I, I can't, mama can't come and cook the cookies. She, she don't do that, but mama paid for the batter, okay, to be cooked. Okay, so mama gave, and they, so the cookies, just think about it. Mama bought everything that's in that cookie you eat. And that guy that was okay. He started realizing mama was contributing, okay? Right. Mama bought all the batter. So all those cookies and those chocolate chips as inside, mama paid for all of that. Right. But mama didn't bake the cookies, right. okay? Right. It's okay that mama didn't bake the cookies, okay? So those are the things that you get to as you begin as a, as a, as a mother trying to deal with kids coming up while you're working at the pace that I was working. And I worked day and night. And it was just that, that was just part of the life. I traveled and I had to go out of town and uh, I had to make balances to be able to talk to them. Or We didn't have all this, imagine Zoom back then. We didn't have Zooms, yeah. they didn't have telephones sometimes and cell phones at, at points of time to my children's life. So um, I think that that's what balance looks like is calendaring what is important to you. And that's all I say about it. Put it on your calendar put and then calendar. You'll, you'll live back. Yeah, I like put that. Put it on the calendar. calendar. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, no, I, I like that. If you weren't doing this, what do you think you'd be doing? If I wasn't doing this work? Yeah. If, oh, you, if, you, weren't, right, if you weren't running this business, because you said you weren't a planned entrepreneur. Well, I, I think I probably would have been over at Google as okay. a senior exec or something. Yeah. Okay. I would have been a, a senior executive in somebody's big company. Right. I would Yeah. I was going that route and that track so i i think i would have been somewhere up in there somebody's big company somewhere in it I like that. That google office. okay i can see you google yeah, been, been there somewhere like that you would see me in forbes somewhere but that still would have been somewhere <laughs> yeah. that's just i probably would have had to wait a little bit longer to get that interview but i still you know <laughs> We would have been interviewed. We still would have done. We still interview. We've been interviewed. I just would have had to, you know, I got to wait maybe another six months. <laughs> that's oh, okay. But that's good. you know when you go when you go back to, when you go to conferences, do you have a strategy that you take when you go to conferences or freelance? Or do you have like something strategic that you're looking to get out of it? Do you you know do you yeah talk talk to us about that? When my, my philosophy for going to a conference was two things. Number one, I went to learn something that I don't know. So I only, you know, sat in rooms where it was something that I thought I need to know. 
And even sometimes when you think you know, you don't know. So that part. And then I always make a point. I want to walk out with at least two new networks, new opportunities to pursue. That's my goal, two. Now, if I get more, that's fine, but just two. So if I went to a conference and I don't walk away with two new networks, look at you and I, I have that. Right. Uh, I picked up two the other day that I didn't have, okay? Right. So that's my objective. So you go to a conference and you go with an objective, two. I need two new opportunities to, to pursue that introduced my company. And then the second part is to be able to sit and learn something. I learned something the other day. I did not know that the FAA did not, you don't have to be it on contracts. That was something I, <laughs> I called from the room. <laughs> you know, to me, I, and I've known FAA for a long right, time. Right. I, we, and, I, and we went and we checked it out. It's genuinely, and it's true. And I'm thinking, whoa, that's, so great opportunity. Let's go right. check them out. Right. So that's something that I said in the conference uh, that it was, they were talking about things that I thought I knew, but that came out of that conference. Okay. Wow. That came out of that conference. So that's what I'm saying. Wow. That's what you're going to go to. Wow, that's good. That's good. Something that you had to do in business that you hated or disliked. Firing people. Oh, yeah. Firing people stuff. Yeah, that's the toughest one. Uh, I'm a person who really, um, really like um, uh, people. Um, and um, I'm a person who really likes people. And, and no matter, you know, unless they've done something very, you know, unethical, you know, then that's not hard for me. But if they are just not performing and I hired them and I still need to let them go and it didn't work out, that's a toughie. Right. That's always a toughie. Me. So, so um, fortunately, I don't have to do that today because I have an HR director. <laughs> and I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, once I hired her about five or six, seven, eight years ago, I've been so excited about that part. I don't um, have to do that. I don't have to touch that 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 employment stuff. You know, okay, if we let them go, they take care of it. They do all what right, they do. Right. Yeah, so that probably- Do, do you still have anything to uh, hiring at all of people? Do I have any? The execs. Okay. Only, only the execs. The chief operating officer does everything else. She does it all. And then, which is my daughter, which I think I mentioned to you, who runs the uh, runs the day-to-day -day operations primarily. And um, and I just only, we're hiring now for a very a senior vice president of a, uh, um, uh, we have a senior vice president for uh, our business development, and I'm restructuring the company in a succession kind of way to bring in various different positions. So those key senior managers, I'm bringing in a new controller, and I'm bringing in the um, senior vice president of business development to a uh, director of uh, federal and a director of commercial sales and some software engineers. I won't do those, the software engineers, but I'll get involved with the directors and the right. VP levels and those senior, that's it. And then everybody else hired from that. And then we have the program managers that govern all this delivery of all of our solutions and our, our business that we have. And I have several of those uh, PMs that are, that's why I don't get surprised. They're corporate and they go out and they make sure that we don't get surprised. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they corporate, huh? They make they sure. Corporate. Corporate. And trained by me. So, you know, I got a couple, a couple that I've had from the first time they came out of the military that now have their uh, CISSP and they are out for cyber and uh, have worked underneath numerous uh, contracts and I, they're ready. They got all of my, I dumped it all right there. Yeah. <laughs> and what to look for, how not to be surprised. I like that. I like that. If if there's someone that you could speak to that's no longer with us today, who is it and what would you tell them? If there was someone that was you could speak to that's no longer here, like in the past. That's no longer here. Right. Um so it could be a celebrity, president, political leader, family member. Um, I, I would say my father. Okay. My, 
Uh, I lost, my mother lived with me, uh, lived, I mean, I lived with me, lived to be 92. So she oh. saw all of the successes right. that I've done in life, but my dad didn't. My dad died when I was 37 and I hadn't even started this business. And so I know I'm, I'm the youngest of five kids. That was my daddy's heart. And if he could just, if I could speak to him and let him see, because right. I had a couple of rough turns in life. And so uh, daddy, I was always very smart and very, you know, made straight A's, but I made some mistakes. And so, but he saw me in the corporate world and he was very proud. But if he could see what I, I didn't dream this big. And if my dad could see that, he, I just know he would just be, wow, look at what she's done. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I was saying. That's great. And then some parting words for the small businesses listening to this, something to leave them with. I think the most important that I have is, you know, success is defined by your dreams, is measured by your desire, is, is defined by your dreams, is achieved by your desires, and measured by both. And so that's fine. That's fine. That's one of my favorites. That's my saying, because I think I emphasize define your success. So you define it. Don't let anyone else define it for you. Define your own success and then set your goals to achieve that success. And then find measurements other than just my revenue. I work hard a lot of years and the revenue wasn't there. I had to learn how to see achievements other than just pure financial. The achievements that I made were different getting the company to the next level or getting the company to another level. And so you have to set milestones and goals for yourself that are both revenue driven, but also performance driven. And then you'll find that you'll be more peaceful at your successes by looking at them differently. So that's what I'd like to leave them with. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> thank you, you did an excellent job. <laughs> Exactly. People are going to get a lot out of this. Um, where can we find you? It, I'm going to put your website on. Is that the best place to reach out? I see you have a LinkedIn profile as well. Yeah. yeah. Both okay. of those. IMRI.com. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get such, how did you get four initials? I guess you start, you said you start a long time ago. Hey, I was out there. <laughs> I'm like, you got four letters. Oh, you got a four yeah. letter website. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's pretty good. IMRI.com. Yeah. That's excellent. That's excellent. No, I, had, you, I keep it. Sometimes I hate a couple of people in, in, infringing upon that. But I'm, I'm yeah. sure they, I mean, that's pretty, I mean, today, you know, if someone tried to buy a four letter domain, it's impossible. <laughs> it, it'd be impossible. So, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> I, you know, they the people listening to this are going to get a, a lot of information. They're going to get a lot of a lot of nuggets out of it. Um, I wrote down a whole page of notes, so they're going to. It's it's going to be. I'm I'm happy that we ran into each other at the conference. Uh, I am too, and and it's genuine. I mean, what you get is genuine. Oh, uh, Thirty years of, of of genuine, you know, experience. You know, you know. So yeah.